Hey everybody, this is Terry Batiste with the Bass Fishing Archives, your sole source for bass fishing history. And today I've got something pretty cool to share with you. It's the uh, first issue of Bassmaster Magazine. Um, came out in the spring of 1968. And uh, it's really, it's the cornerstone of everything uh, bass fishing magazine wise. Uh, it's the first uh, magazine that was put out that was uh, concentrated on bass. Uh, Back prior to uh, the, this magazine, you had uh, publications like Outdoor Life and Sports of Field and Field and Stream, uh, and you were hard pressed to, you know, have one issue that 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 had one article in it. Uh, maybe you know every you know three or four issues, uh, and then when uh, Ray Scott came up with uh, the concept of uh, Bass Angler Sportsman Society and Bassmaster Magazine, this magazine right here changed it all. Um, I've been given permission uh, by Bass to go through the first uh, few years of their uh, Bassmaster magazine issues with you all, and uh, it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, these magazines, like I said, they were the cornerstone of, of Bass-centric magazines, and uh, looking through these old issues, what you what you find is the the, the anglers that started it all they started bass fishing uh, obviously you know ray scott was there uh as the the the, the commander in chief uh but who, who was fishing these early tournaments in 67 and 68 69 and 70 um you know other than bill dance maybe people don't really know who was actually the at the forefront of competitive bass fishing um you know going through these magazines you're going to see a bunch of old articles uh, you're going to see uh, a bunch of old ads, uh, some of the companies that are no longer with us and, and some companies that are still uh, with us. But uh, first, let me, let me uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what we're trying to do here uh, at the Bass Fishing Archives YouTube channel. Uh, hopefully some of you have visited the, the website. The website's been uh, back up since uh, March of 2021. Uh, and so we're pushing a year with the, uh, with the website. And on the website, We've been posting uh, roughly about five articles a week uh, on the web. But if you go to the web, the uh, YouTube channel, uh, you'll see that it, you know, we, we loaded a bunch up at the beginning of the year uh, and then kind of went months without doing anything. Uh, and in the last uh, month or so, we've uh, put, you know, I think three or four newer uh, videos or new old videos up uh, on, on the channel. And with this today, what we're going to try to do is try to be putting out a video once a week, uh, probably on the weekends, uh, and it will con contain, you know, old Bassmaster magazines, uh, old uh, uh, Bass Casters Association magazines, old Fish and Tackle. Uh, Lord knows I have enough old gear from the, uh, the 70s uh, and 80s out in my garage that I can share with you all. Um, We'll be talking to uh, uh, old anglers or, you know, original anglers uh, at, at the Bassmaster Classic coming up in Greenville. Uh, and uh, essentially just, just trying to document the, the history of the sport of bass fishing uh, through not just the website and Instagram and Facebook, but also here on YouTube. Um, and uh, so let's uh, get back into this magazine here. So. As I stated earlier, the magazine was the first of its kind, uh, and it was part of Ray Scott's dream uh, to help bring all bass anglers together, uh, to give them a pedestal to stand on, uh, possibly uh, raise the sport up to you know what golf and, and, and bowling was during the day. Um, and the, the magazine would, and, and the society would be the glue that would hold all the anglers together. And once Ray had enough of a, 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 a group of people uh, back in him, then he would be able to do things like make bigger tournaments. But, but number one on his list was environmental issues. Uh, in, all across the United States back in the 60s, uh, industrial pollution was a huge thing. And it was his goal to clean up the water of the United States and preserve fishing for the future. Um, along with making a couple of bucks, obviously. Um, so uh, this magazine here, um, this is, again, this is the, the, the first issue of spring 1968. 
There were 2,000 copies of this uh, when it first came out, and I'm, I'm dead, dead sure that, that, that Ray did not have 2,000 uh, subscribers or members of BASS at the time to give all these magazines out. Um, so over the course of uh, time, as people would sign up, they'd get back issues, and next thing you know, 2,000 issues are gone. Uh, and then in, in, in 1992, when Ray and, and company BASS held the 25th anniversary event at Beaver Lake in Arkansas, they reprinted the first issue. And that's what the, this first issue that I'm showing you right now is, is it's a reprint of the original uh, that Ray gave me back in 2012, and it's got some interesting stuff written on the cover uh, that he wrote to me. And uh, I'll go through that when we, we, we sit down at the computer. Um, the one behind it is actually a, an original. Um, and I received this in a pile of uh, magazines and books that I received uh, uh, some time ago. And I rarely take this out of its, out of its uh, sheath uh, because I don't want it to get messed up. It's already got coffee stains and stuff on it from the previous owner. Um, but it's in immaculate shape. Uh, and they're, they're pretty fun to look at. Uh, so what we're going to go through today is uh, the reprinted copy. Um, what I have instead of uh, aiming a camera at the magazine as I thumb through it, uh, I've downloaded it onto the computer and we're essentially going to go through uh, a, a slide presentation, uh, as you would say. Um, and I'll go through every page of the magazine and uh, give you an idea of what it was like to read uh, the spring issue of of uh, Bassmaster Magazine from 1968. All right, here's the uh, first issue of Bassmaster Magazine. Um, and uh, we got the cover here. Uh, interesting uh, bit of information about the cover. Uh, the image of uh, the issue is an angler named uh, Jimmy uh, Holt out of Nashville, Tennessee. And according to Ray, uh, who wrote on the cover here uh, is that he fished uh, in that very first tournament in 67 and he's the all-time record of the smallest limit in bass, a limit of 10 fish that weighed 1 pound 13 ounces or 29 ounces total or 2.9 ounces per fish. Now, <coughs> good old Ray says it's a fact. I don't know how it can be to have uh, 10 fish that weighed 2.9 ounces each. Uh, especially since there were uh, size limits or length limits of the fish, but if Ray says it was fact. Uh, maybe we uh, maybe we need to believe uh, what it, what he's saying. <laughs> anyway, all right. So let's go to the next page here. We have uh, the inside cover of the magazine, and uh, this is Ray with an ad uh, asking you know any prospective uh, advertisers to, to to advertise with BASS. Um, the ad uh, says uh, this page available to manufacturers of products used by our Bass membership. It's an advertising bullseye every time in the Bassmaster magazine. Our members are 100% bass fishermen and prospective users of your product. There's good old uh, Ray, the insurance salesman, doing the hard sell right off the bat. Um, so let's go to the next page here. All right, so page one. Uh, starts off, it's the masthead, or what would normally be uh, considered a masthead in a magazine. Uh, and the masthead is generally where you would see the, the publisher's name, uh, the editor, uh, managing editor, you know, staff writers, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, it would be maybe have the index uh, uh, in it, and that's what this one does here. Um, and uh, but the, the the deal with uh, with this masthead is that Ray is pretty much a one man show here. Uh, all the uh, articles that were written were either written by him uh, or uh, invited uh, anglers uh, who he uh, he got to uh, write an article for the first issue. It was kind of uh, an interesting uh, deal uh, when you consider you know magazines today. You would you would never. Uh, you know, do your magazine that way. Um, and then also on the masthead, he had his uh, first letter from the editor uh, to, the, uh, to the folks uh, that would be reading it, uh, bass fishermen like you and me. 
And um, in his editorial, he talks about lifting bass fishing up uh, on a pedestal uh, to that equivalent of golf, uh, bowling. Uh, he even mentions pocket billiards, which uh, back in the day must have been a, a pretty big deal. Uh, but you always saw golf and bowling on, on TV. And he felt that uh, bass fishing needed to be elevated uh, up to that same level. Uh, the only problem that he had was how could he charge uh, uh, for people to come and line up on the, the, the side of a lake or a bank of a lake or in a boat, uh, how could he charge them admission so he could come up with a uh, way to have prize money for the, the anglers. And what he decided is that, well, heck, if, uh, you know, if I charge an entry fee to the tournament, um, the guys will be, you know, have, they'll have money to, to, to be fishing for. And so that's what he did with the All-American at Beaver, uh, he uh, sent out a bunch of invitations uh, to anglers. Uh, Bob Cobb was actually instrumental in helping uh, get a bunch of guys from the, uh, the Tulsa area to come out. Um, and I believe it was uh, Stan Sloan uh, that got a bunch of guys from the Memphis area. And uh, word, word got around. Um, they all paid the, the $100 entry fee, and lo and behold, the, the, the first event at Beaver Lake uh, kicked off in June of 1967. Um, everybody that, that he was telling about this, you know, said that he was nuts and that he, he wouldn't ever, you know, get anybody to, to fish the tournament, which turned out to be absolutely wrong. In fact, it was such a big success that in October that same year, Scott held uh, his second event, this time at Smith uh, Lake in Alabama, and uh, instead of drawing 106 anglers, he drew 114 uh, from 15 states. And uh, then uh, his first event in 1968 was on Lake Seminole, and he drew 150 anglers to that event, 74 of which had already fished his first two. So BASS, Bass Angler Sportsman Society, and uh, Race Goths tournaments actually you know, were a resounding success. Um, so let's uh, go here to uh, the next page, and uh, we have uh, Ray with an announcement of essentially what is Bass Angler Sportsman Society and what is Bassmaster Magazine. And so he's got his bass purposes here. Uh, what is the purpose of the organization? And the, the main uh, purpose of the organization, according to him, was to organize bass anglers um, stimulate and publish awareness of bass fishing, um, improve uh, the skills of bass anglers by the articles that would be written in the magazine, uh, demand higher water standards, uh, encourage research into bass, um, promote kids fishing, and then present national championship bass tournaments. That was the purpose of BASS uh, at the time. And in order to do that, he needed to get subscribers and members. And the benefits for becoming a member of BASS and subscribing to Bassmaster Magazine, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, you, you got a yearly subscription to the magazine. Uh, you got a bass patch that he wanted you to wear on your fishing jacket or your coat. Uh, and then by joining the organization... Uh, you would become an investor in the fulfillment of all the goals of the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. Um, you know, as it turned out, it was needed uh, back in the day. Uh, my opinion, it's still needed. And, uh, you know, it was uh, the only person out there that was trying to do something along these lines. And then uh, also on the page of, uh, under Bass Lines, there's some, uh, some jokes that I don't know if the, he came up with them or or what, but they're, they're, they're kind of goofy. And then, of course, we've got Join Bass today. All right, so we get on to page three. Uh, this is the beginning of the magazine, of the articles in the magazine, at least. And uh, here we have a gentleman by the name of Billy Burns from Lexington, Kentucky, uh, who was asked by Ray to do an article on uh, essentially jig and pig fishing. Um, Evidently, uh, Burns was a, a, a pretty decent or a pretty adept at uh, fishing the jig. And uh, so what Burns does is he goes through and uh, describes what he does uh, in order to fish a jig and pork uh, eel uh, is what he was fishing. It wasn't a pork frog. 
And uh, essentially what he does is he's uh, talking about uh, fishing the pork trailer on his jigs and uh, what kind of cover, what kind of structure he's looking for, uh, what depths is he concentrating on, what type of shoreline, is it steep, you know, rocky, etc. cetera. Um, and if you look at the article uh, and, and read it, it, everything that he talks about in this article is still uh, good information for today for someone that wants to learn how to fish a jig. Um, you know, and here we got Bill Burns with a seven and a half pound uh, smallmouth uh, that ends up being the uh, Watuga Lake record uh, out of Kentucky, I guess. Um, that's a big fish, no matter uh, what year you're from. And then uh, on the next page here, we've got some of his uh, hair jigs that he's tipped with, uh, with uh, pork eels. So, yeah, it was a, it's a great article. Um, only, you know, a couple of pages long, uh, but it gets to the point, and uh, you actually learn something from it. Um, we've got page five here, um, and again, we've got an invited article by Ray. Uh, Ray has asked uh, Don Miller here if he had to choose his favorite lure, what would it be for this time of year in uh, the area that you live? And Don lived in Ohio, and uh, Don ends up uh, here writing about a topwater bait called the Spinaditty, which was the smaller... Uh, brother of the Nipididdy, which was made by South Bend. I believe the Nipididdy may still be manufactured by Pradco, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that the Spinadiddy is, uh, is no longer um, in production. Anyway, um, Miller talks about you know, his favorite areas to use the bait, um, the time of year, uh, and, uh, you know, it's a pretty fair account on, on how to walk, how to work a topwater prop bait, um, essentially anywhere in the United States. Um, again, it's written by a, an angler who doesn't have any, uh, any, uh, preconceived notions as to why he's telling you to use this bait. He's just, uh, writing something about, how, you know, one of his favorite lures. And uh, here we go. We got Don Miller again with a seven pounder uh, that, that he caught, I presume, on a spin of ditty. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so the next article uh, that we have is a Springtime is Lunker Time, and this one's by Bill O'Connor from Albany, Georgia. Now, if you look at the size of the fish in these pictures, he's got a 15 here, he's got a 12 here, and then he's got three fish or four fish down here uh, 13 and a half, 12 and a half, 12 and a quarter, and 12 pounds. Those are big fish. All came out of Seminole, and uh, O'Connor's uh, talking here about fishing Seminole in the spring, and uh, talking about uh, using you know spinner baits uh, in the shallower water. Uh, his favorite uh, color was yellow, uh, and and essentially targeting everything that that you as a spinner bait fisherman today are going to target. You're going to look for weed beds. You're going to look for laydowns. Um, and, uh, you know, you're going to work the bait faster in clear water and you're going to work the bait slower, uh, in, in dirty water. Um, now one thing he talked about, uh, was the use of a single spin, uh, did not even mention the double spin. So this is back in the day when the single spin was a lot more popular than a double spin was. And, uh, so uh, that was for fishing the shallow water at Seminole. For fishing the deeper water, when the fish were not moved up onto beds yet, uh, he talks about cranking uh, hellbenders and bombers uh, out on the ledges uh, that uh, are, you know, the, the, the pathways of the fish to go into the shallower uh, creeks and stuff. Um, he talks about using a white bomber and a white bell hellbender. Obviously, bombers made by bomber lures or was because uh, we're talking about the old uh, wooden bomber and even maybe the plastic bomber that had the metal lip. And uh, Hellbender was made by Whopper Stopper, and these were just giant, deep-running lures uh, that, that are still... The, the bomber's not made anymore, but the, the Hellbender, I believe, still is by Pradco. Um, but nobody... I, I haven't seen someone throw one of these baits in, in 20 years. They'd probably still work. Um, but decent article on uh, what to expect from uh, Lake Seminole and, uh, you know, just a, another good read. All right, so page eight. 
Uh, page eight, what we have here is a story by Bob Hamilton, who uh, caught the record uh, spotted bass in uh, March of 66. And this is a story about how he caught it. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially what he did is it was a, it was a really, really nasty day. It was below freezing, uh, ninth by nine thirty in the morning, he couldn't find anybody to go fish with him. So he decided to hook the boat up anyway and, and go by himself. And, uh, he gets to the lake and goes into the concession and, and talks to the owner if, uh, see if there had been any bigger fish caught lately. And, and she had told him that she hadn't seen a big spot in, in, in quite some time. And uh, so he hemmed and hawed and decided, oh, you know, I'm, I'll, I'm here. I might as well go out. And he, in his write-up, he says that uh, he, he fought the wind on the main lake for three hours and uh, finally decided to go back into a creek that he had had some success in previously. And within a few casts uh, fishing the bluff wall, he uh, caught a couple of two-pound largemouth and then a few casts later, he hooked into something big. And that something big was what ended up being an eight pound spot uh, that became the world record. Um, he got it in the bottom of the boat, uh, got it back to his house, took it to a buddy of his, uh, Archie Phillips, who was a taxidermist. And the taxidermist said that it was the biggest fish that he had, biggest spot that he'd ever seen, and that it was probably a world record. So they uh, went down to the store, had it weighed on certified scales, uh, had it measured, witnesses signed affidavits, uh, and uh, uh, Hamilton sent that off to Field and Stream, who at the time was in charge of all the world record uh, documentation. And a month later, he, uh, he gets a, a, a letter in the mail from Field and Stream saying that, indeed, he had caught the world record. Okay, so he takes it to the taxidermist, and, and uh, his, his taxidermist buddy says, "Yeah, this this fish probably this record probably will never be broken." But uh, Hamilton had a a, a, a different thought, and uh, about ten years later, in uh, March of uh, 1978, the record was broken uh, again on Smith Lake uh, by an 815, and then it wasn't uh, but a few years later that uh, Lake Paris in Southern California went on a binge and they kicked out a nine, a nine one, and, and a bunch of fish over nine pounds uh, all within a couple years. And uh, today the record stands at 11 pounds, four ounces, again caught out of California at Bullard's, uh, Bullard's Bar Reservoir uh, in Northern California. So there's a story of uh, Hamilton's world record spot and uh, the next page, page nine, we've got Magic Movements by Top Water Masters. And uh, this is by Bill Bowling, who was another uh, angler on the early Bassmaster Trail um, and uh, was asked by Ray to write an write a st article on what he liked to do. And evidently, Bowling was a, a, a Zara Spook expert. And you can tell by reading the article uh, that he definitely knew what, what he was doing. Uh, he fished. His home lake was uh, Table Rock. He actually worked on the lake in a marina. And uh, he goes into the article about, you know, what are the best, uh, uh, you know, techniques to use, the walk the dog. Uh, he goes into a really good explanation on how to walk the dog. Uh, the rod that he used was a, a Head and Mark IV, uh, which <laughs> that, that hasn't been made for a, a, a couple years. Um, but it tells you, you know, what type of, uh, areas to concentrate around the lake, you know, submerged islands or, or brush or, or what have you. And to make multiple casts, uh, he says that, you know, I rarely catch my fish on the first or second cast to a particular piece of cover. It's usually on the fourth, fifth or sixth cast. And, uh, most of the stories about him and his buddy Herb and this, this trip that they went out throwing the spook. And uh, they, they whack some, some really good fish. But at the end of the day, uh, Bowling gets a, 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 a boil on, a, on the spook of a big fish. It's, it's huge. And uh, they can't get the fish to come back up. And uh, the end of the story, he talks about how he went out six days later and uh, caught that fish and it ended up going uh, well over seven pounds. So another great article by, a, by another fisherman. And... Uh, you know, this initial magazine was a was a, a pretty good hit. 
we got 10, that's more about the spook. And then on page 11, uh, we have an article written uh, by the chief uh, of the Division of Fish and Game out of Montgomery, Alabama, by a gentleman named of, uh, Charles Kelly. And uh, in this article, what Kelly's talking about is, is pollution and uh, water pollution specifically in Alabama. Uh, he's talking about, you know, the government putting forth all these, you know, laws in effect, but the, the laws are either written to where the uh, industrial, you know, folks are able to pollute uh, and, um, or they're just not, you know, making any laws at all. Um, and so Kelly goes in and, and talks about something called uh, dissolved oxygen content and that uh, fisheries biologists for 100 years at that point uh, had recommended and noted that in order to have a good sustainable game fish population, uh, you had to have a constant uh, dissolved oxygen content of 5 ppm or higher. Uh, whereas some states like Georgia and Alabama were, were writing into legislation that the, 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 the waters only had to maintain a 4 ppm uh, dissolved oxygen concentration. And uh, he is essentially talking here that uh, people need to get together uh, and, and start complaining uh, that, that the, the regulations need to be not just upheld, but they need to be uh, made more stringent. Uh, so we don't lose uh, the, the the game fish uh, and the fisheries that we that we currently had back in 1968. Uh, again, this is essentially what Ray was wanting to found, or one of the things that Ray wanted to found Bass under as an environmental uh, uh, organization that was going to fight for uh, the the preservation of our waters and our sport fishing. We got page 12 is just a uh, carry on of that article. And then on page 13, we have uh, essentially the, the rules for fishing a Bassmaster tournament. Now, these rules here happen to be for the Seminole Lunker tournament. Um, I don't know if they changed much, uh, but we'll go through them here real quick and I'll, I'll probably point out a, where, they, where they did change from lake to lake. Um, so we have. Uh, participants and eligibility. Uh, again, this is for the Seminole Lunker Bass Tournament. Essentially, uh, anybody was uh, was allowed to enter the tournament as long as you were invited by Ray. Now, Ray, in order to get the first two tournaments off in uh, 1967, uh, went to riders, he went to taxidermists and uh, bass fishermen that he knew of in areas and asked for them to suggest you know, three or four of their friends that they knew who were good fishermen that would possibly want to fish a tournament. After those tournaments, he had a pretty good Rolodex of anglers um, and continued asking uh, for other names. But you weren't in the tournament unless you actually received an invite from Ray Scott. So the the... Entry fee for the Seminole tournament had gone up 25 bucks, so it was $125. Um, and uh, that entry fee, he says, could be paid by a sponsor. But this is where he drew the line. You couldn't be a guide on the lake and fish the tournament. And the way he defined a professional guide was any person who earned a fishing, uh, as a fishing guide more than $500 in any one of the past four years. Um, then he also uh, uh, eliminated uh, anglers who lived within the four counties that surrounded Seminole. So if you were living in one of the four counties around Seminole and had lived there for two years or longer, you were not eligible to fish the tournament, which was crazy as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that would never hold today. Um, so let's look at the types of tackle. The tackle is essentially the same stuff that uh, we all fish today. Um, artificial only uh, with uh, no live bait, but pork rind is, is okay. Uh, electronic depth finders, uh, they're permitted, and he specifically calls out the Lawrence uh, fish locator. Boat and motor. Um, this is an interesting one. Fishing boats may be used that are 13 feet or more in length. Any motor may be used that is nine and a half horsepower or larger. 
Um, <laughs> wow, that's that's insane. And then he also opened it up uh, that if you wanted to rent a boat, you could do that too, as long as it met the the, the bare requirements. Um, pretty crazy. Uh, thinking about uh, getting to a lake, renting a boat, and, and going and fishing a tournament. Uh, that That's uh, pretty cool. Anyway, we get to uh, boat identification. Uh, each boat would be uh, handed a uh, pair of stickers, and that stickers would have a number on it, uh, and you were to affix those to each side of the boat uh, in plain sight so they could determine whether or not you were in the tournament. Uh, boat operation and expense. Um, it's suggested by BASS that the non-boater uh, supply all the fuel and the oil uh, for the uh, for the boater. And uh, let's see here. The contestant who is operating the boat shall have the privilege of selecting their route to the fishing water. Um, essentially, uh, each angler had uh, control of the boat for 50% of the day, kind of like what it was up until uh, the, the, the whole co-angler thing started. Um, you know, and uh, if you wanted to have the boat for half the day, it was your right. Permitted fishing locations. Uh, fishing was permitted anywhere on Lake Seminole except uh, marinas, boat docks, or within 50 yards of another contestant. Um, essentially, you know, the, the today you're allowed to fish you know, most, most marinas and, and, and obviously boat docks. Um, and then the 50 yard rule still, still is, is upheld. Uh, contestants are pair off. Okay. This is an interesting portion here. Uh, back in the early days, uh, they would not allow two contestants that were from the same city, county, or even possibly state fish together. Um, and, uh, they had to uh, stay within sight of each other, essentially the way it is today. Um, you got to stay within sight each of each other until your fish are all weighed and you've received your way slip. So the next, next page, uh, observers. This was an interesting, uh, uh, thing that I found on these first, uh, tournaments was that, uh, during the second and third day of each top of during the second and third day, each of the top 20 leaders will fish only with an official observer. All others would be paired with partners. Now that was uh, something that I had no idea that happened actually. Um, and the observer, it says, is not to operate the boat, shall not fish, or interfere with the fishermen in any what any way whatsoever. Um, that's uh, that's interesting, and it it you know goes up to the the elites when the elites finally got to you know fish with an observer or uh, you know uh, someone that what they weren't fishing against. Uh, the tournament hours. There's another good one for you. Tournament hours start at 7 a.m. and end at 6 p.m. for Friday and Saturday. And on sa uh, Sunday, uh, the, they start at 6 a.m. and end at 4 p.m. That's a heck of a long day. And if you grew up back in the 70s and fished even club tournaments, my old club, we would fish from dawn until dusk. And sometimes in the summer, that was a 14-hour day, and you were whipped by the end. Um, late penalties. Uh, if you're back, uh, you're, you're docked 2% of your total points for each minute that you're late, up to 60%. And then any contestant uh, back to the dock later than 30 minutes was DQ'd. Scoring uh, was done on a point system, and uh, it was uh, one point per ounce. Uh, 15 fish total daily bag limit. So for a three-day tournament, you could weigh 45 fish. Um, and uh, they allowed uh, largemouth Kentuckys and uh, smallmouth uh, to be weighed in, which is pretty much the same as it is today. Uh, protests, you needed to file a protest within 30 minutes of uh, weighing your fish. Uh, all the fish that were caught went to charity. Uh, ties, uh, in the case of a first place tie, there would be a sudden death fish off between the two con contestants. Um, and then any other tie shall be resolved by means selected by the tournament officials. And these kind of got crazy at times. I remember, uh, reading and talking to Roland Martin about a time that he had a, a big fish tie on uh, Watts bar here in Tennessee. 
Um, and uh, Ray Scott made him and the guy that he tied for Big Fish do wind sprints to see who was the fastest. And Roland ended up winning that, uh, that one. Uh, sportsmanship, you're DQ'd if you're not acting in a sportsman uh, with good sportsmanship. And then uh, it says here, drunkenness on any part of the contestant during the tournament will not be tolerated and shall be cause for automatic disqualification from this and all future All-American tournaments. He's pretty serious about the drinking. All right, so the, the Seminole payout, uh, the champion would get two grand. Uh, second place was 1,000, third, 500, all the way down to 15th place uh, for 125 bucks. Um, all the, uh, the people that placed got a trophy along with their money. Uh, largest bass uh, paid out uh, $10 per pound. And uh, let's see here, we've got state leaders plaque. So if you, your state uh, had more than five anglers in the event, uh, and uh, you were the leading uh, person in that state, uh, then you got a state leader's plaque. And then there was a Roadrunner trophy that was awarded to the person that drove the furthest uh, to the tournament. And then over here, you got the tournament program, motel reservations, the whole nine yards. Okay, the next uh, article that we have is uh, really cool. The title is uh, Expert Fishermen, They're a Different Breed. And if you look at the byline, it's by Bob Cobb, Outdoor Editor, Tulsa Tribune. This is Bob Cobb's first article in Bassmaster. And uh, as you know, Bob Cobb would go on to become the, uh, the, the managing editor of Bassmaster Magazine uh, about a year and a half later. And uh, not only that, he would become the voice of Bassmaster TV in 1986. Um, this, this article... It, talks about a time that Cobb fished with uh, this angler, Ralph Day, at a U.S. Open Fishing Championship at Table Rock Lake in Missouri, and the extremes that Ralph Day went to catching fish, uh, and how it differed from any other angler that he had ever fished with uh, that, you know, he would consider just your everyday angler. Uh, Ralph evidently cast into the thickest stuff over tree limbs, through tree limbs, uh, caught fish, you know, uh, hooked fish in, in, in the snags and, you know, went crashing through them with his big motor, uh, which was like a 25 horse, uh, to get to the fish so he could, uh, you know, get it in the boat. And, and that just, it, it really set Cobb back as to what a serious expert angler was compared to your standard weekend your angler or a guy that would fish maybe you know two or three times a year. Great article. And then on page 17, we've got uh, a, an article titled Lunker Yard USA. There's no, uh, no one uh, as the author, um, you know, so maybe it was, uh, maybe it was uh, Ray that wrote it. But it's an article on Lake Seminole, um, and the heyday of Lake Seminole. Um, Seminole was about 10 years old at the time. It was inundated in 1957. And uh, just look at this, this board of fish here. Every one of these things looks between to be nine, probably, a, you know, that's probably a 13, 14 pound fish here. Um, and uh, you've got uh, Sam Cagle and Matt Lynch of Nashville. Uh, view their day's catch with Jack Wingate. And Jack Wingate had that ever-famous lodge on Seminole back in the day. Uh, the first paragraph here says, One February day, they weighed 22 largemouth black bass at Jack Wingate's lodge on the shores of Sprawling Lake Seminole. 20 of them weighed at least 9 pounds. And then the next paragraph, Last February, 81 bass over 8 pounds were caught. Uh, that's, those are amazing numbers. Too bad, you know. Maybe we can get them back. I, you know, maybe Seminole is, is, you know, doing better than it was in the past. But this is the heyday of Seminole. Uh, they talk about, uh, you know, where, where the best areas to fish are on the lake, what to use this time of year, which would be, you know, the spring. And uh, it, was a, it was a good article to, to kind of look back and see what Seminole could put out. The next page, uh, 18 and 19, is the uh, tournament report on the Dixie Invitational that was held at Smith Lake 
uh, Alabama in uh, October of 1967. So this was Ray's second tournament. Um, it's a pretty meager tournament report. It's only two pages long and, and maybe 500 words at that. Uh, up here we got Ray Mariski uh, with uh, you know 10, 10 spots that he had caught. You got Don Butler here with a six pounder that he caught in practice. Uh, and then you've got Roy Self uh, here with a limit of 15 uh, spots. Um, and then the write-up of you know who won it and uh, what they got. Now, unfortunately, there's no weights in the uh, write-up. It does say they caught 850 pounds of fish, um, and that 97 percent of the bass were hard-fighting spots. Um, and uh, it was Gerald Blanchard, Memphis, Tennessee, that uh, won the event, and he won two thousand dollars in cash. Uh, Bill Dance was second. He got a thousand. Third place went to Jack Wingate. Fourth place went to Ray Mursky. Fifth place went to uh, Tom Mann. He got three hundred bucks. Sixth place went to Roy Self. He got two hundred. Seventh was Bob Hamilton. He got one hundred and seventy-five. Eighth was uh, Roy Fairchild. Ninth was Charles Ferguson. Tenth place was Jim Rogers out of uh, Missouri, who also had Rogers uh, lures. Uh, 11th place was uh, John Reed and uh, Bill Bowling. Uh, they both tied uh, for 11th place and they each got 140 bucks. Uh, we got Gerald Blanchard here uh, at the board. He's all smiles. And then here's Blanchard down here accepting this massive trophy that the NPFL would even be, uh, uh, you know, envious of. Uh, that's an insane trophy. I wonder, I wonder if it's uh, still around. And then uh, page 20 here, we've got the, the All-American Bass Tournament uh, report. This was, again, Ray's first tournament, 1967, at Beaver Lake. Um, and, uh, again, there's really not much of a write-up. You've got uh, a picture here, Ray congratulating Sloan. The, uh, the, the, the tournament board, which is, oh, man, I wish I was old enough to have seen one of these um, back in the day, that thing is just monstrous, and it would have been awesome to to have been in the south and and, and, and look at that thing. Um, and then on the next page, we've got again we got Ray presenting the trophy to uh, Sloan and his wife. She's got the check, and uh, all the fish were donated to the uh, Boys Land of Arkansas. And of course, you got to have a you got to have a, a, a band that, that plays for the Dixie Invitational. In this case, it was the uh, Skunk Hollow Gang out of uh, Springdale, Arkansas. So let's look at who uh, placed in the top 11 uh, at that tournament. Um, again, uh, we know that Stan Sloan won it, and he walked away with $2,000 cash and uh, all-expense-paid trip to Acapulco, Mexico with his wife. Uh, Dance uh, got second place in the Grand. Third place was Alderson Clark. Uh, he got 500 bucks. Fourth place was Ray Mursky again with 350. Uh, fifth place was Wes Littlefield. Sixth place, Carl Dice, another big heavy hitter back in the day. Seventh place was John Tate. Eighth place was Troy Anderson. Ninth place was J.G. Wells or Glenn Wells of uh, Greenbrier, Tennessee. Uh, Wells was a Big, big angler back in the day. 10th place was uh, J.L. Johnson, and 11th place was E.R. Pauly. Um, and uh, Pauly got 140 bucks for finishing 11th place. And that's about it for the tournament report from the All-American. Um, the next uh, two pages, uh, 22 and 23, are letters to the editor. Uh, essentially, uh, between the time of the first tournament and uh, the second tournament, uh, BASS and Bassmaster Magazine had uh, stirred up quite a bit of interest, and every single one of these letters to the editor uh, were actually writing Ray to give them more information about how to join BASS and get Bassmaster Magazine. It's amazing how fast, uh, you know, word travels. I mean, there was someone in New York that wrote, you know, most everybody was from the South, um, but you got a guy from Liverpool, New York, writing that had heard about bass tournaments and BASS. 
You got Jack Wendate's, uh, you know, lodge. He uh, put the ad in the in the paper or in the in, the, in Bassmaster magazine here. Um, and then the uh, next page is uh, announcing the Rebel Invitational Bass Tournament that was set for April of '68. Um, Ray and company were were really excited about this tournament. The lake was only three and a half years old. Um, and uh, they were expecting this to be uh, their best tournament weight-wise uh, out of any of the tournaments that they had held so far, which kind of surprised me because they're just getting out of, out of uh, Seminole, which is a known lunker factory. Anyway, um, talking about the lake and its history and, you know, all the, the good fishing that it has and, you know, what's going to be required and where the headquarters of the tournament and stuff were. A uh, pretty good rundown of Ross Barnett. And then the inside back cover is uh, Ray's way of uh, having you take your son fishing or take a kid fishing. Uh, and the caption says, Daddy never had time to take me fishing. Take a boy fishing today. Um, and you'd never get away with this ad <laughs> today. <laughs> um, and then the last page or the back, the back side of the cover uh, it says, join the bass today, and uh, I guess you were supposed to cut out a, these uh, entry forms and, or membership forms and put your 10 or $25 or a lifetime membership of 100 bucks in an envelope and uh, send them to Montgomery, Alabama and become part of the Bass Angler Sportsman Society. So, folks, that's, that's it. Uh, that, that ends uh, the spring 1968 issue of Bassmaster Magazine. Well, I hope you all liked this look back at the 1968 spring issue of Bassmaster Magazine. If you like the uh, video, please hit the like button and let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more. Like I said at the beginning of the video, we've got the green light to uh, go through the first three, four, five years of Bassmaster Magazine from BASS. And also, if you like the, the channel, please hit the subscribe button. At the beginning of the video, I said we were going to shoot a video a week, so stay tuned for another look uh, back on the history of the sport. And don't forget to check out our website, bass-archives.com, as well as follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And until then, tight lines and heavy limits.